Um, so I know that there are a lot of people who are here at the museum for the first time. So let me welcome you. I'm Carol Wilk. I'm the founder, director, and curator of the museum. And if you just wandered up the back stairs here, you've come in the wrong way for the experience, full experience of the Skyscraper Museum. I hope that you'll come back or after the, uh, after the talk, take a look at our exhibition, which is on uh, 10 and taller, all the buildings in Manhattan that were 10 stories or taller from the very first one in 1874 through 1900. Um, we at the museum like to do, well, we do two special exhibitions a year, and we alternate between topics that are historical and New York-centric uh, and international and uh, contemporary as well. So. We take the whole world uh, as our, uh, you know, skyscraper uh, domain, and we uh, like, but we especially like to explore New York history. Uh, if you look on our website, you'll see that we have an author's talk every month. Um, and if you'd like to, to, I think you actually, by virtue of having signed up today, you will now be on our e-blast unless you opt out. So you will learn about our monthly author's talks. Uh, the next one, of which is just next week, next. Tuesday, no, the, the December 6th, that is next uh, Tuesday, when Camilo Vergara will talk about, a photographer will talk about his new, new book, uh, Detroit is No Dry Bones, and if you know uh, Camilo's work, you know that he likes to go back to American cities um, year by year, well, year by decade, um, in order to record from the same position the changing fortunes um, of, of the city in Detroit, certainly. Uh, lends itself uh, well to that um, drama, if not tragedy. Uh, so, so we like topics that explore urban themes, um, and we also like to like urban history. But we're interested in how the world operates, and especially in its layers and in its um, verticality. So when Anne and Verso both uh, suggested the idea of um, this as a venue for tonight's book talk, indeed, I mean book launch and book party, right, in the, here in the US. Um, and uh, we, were, we were delighted to, uh, um, to accept the idea of vertical as a, an appropriate theme. So I'm just happy to be here and to be a, not be the one responsible for the event and for selling the books. Uh, but Anne uh, Rumberger from Brazil Press is, is going to introduce um, Stephen and also uh, Keller Easterling, uh, who will join him in conversation after about 25 minutes or so of a um, slide presentation from the book. Uh, there's plenty of seats up here, too. I'm going to sit here so I know this doesn't pull off. Uh, hi, my name is Anne Rumberger. I'm from Verso Books. Uh, thanks so much for coming out to the launch of these Trans Vertical. Um, I'm going to read two very brief bios for uh, Steve and for Kelly Sterling, who will be joining in the conversation. Um, and the book is available here for sale. You're in the film if you stand over here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have books available for sale here. They're $30. We also have them available for sale on our website at versobooks.com for even cheaper. But if you want a copy now and want it signed by Steve, um, you can buy a copy after, after the talk. Uh, so Stephen Graham is a professor of cities and society at uh, the Global Urban Research Institute based in Newcastle University's School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. He is the author or editor of several books, including Telecommunications and the City, and Splintering Urbanism, Cities, War, and Terrorism, Disrupted Cities When Infrastructures Fail, Cities Under Siege, The New Military Urbanism, and Vertical, The City from Satellite to Bunkers, which just came out. And uh, Keller Easterling is an award-winning writer, architect, and professor at the Yale School of Architecture. She's the author of Organization, Space, and Enduring Innocence, which was named Architect's Best Book of 2005. Easterling is also the author of two essay-length books, an e-book, The Action is in the Form, Victor Hugo's TED Talk, and a forthcoming book, Subtraction. Her writing and design work will be included in the 2014 uh, Venice Biennale. Easterling lectures widely in the US and abroad and contributes to uh, Domus, Art Forum, Gray Room, Eflux, Cabinet, and Volume. And uh, Keller is also the author of Extra, Straight, Extra Statecraft, which just came out in paperback from Verso Books. I have one copy here for sale, and we also have copies available online. Um, so I'll turn it over to Steve, who's going to be giving a brief talk, followed by a conversation with uh, Keller Eastern. 
Thank you very much, Ryan, and, and thank you very much to the museum for, for hosting this, um, and to Kala for, for joining, joining in the celebrations. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and above all, thanks to everyone for coming along through the, the biblical floods on our side. It's much appreciated. Um, let me just grab the right one here. I just wanted to say a bit about where the book comes from and its perspectives, because clearly dealing with cities from a vertical perspective, from satellites through the layers of architecture and drone piloting, helicopters, there's, there's elements of the book addressing those, through the sort of built environment that we can eventually discuss um, into the subterranean can bring in a myriad of perspectives. Um, but the book really is an attempt to try and grapple with the, set, the sort of political aspects of geography from a three-dimensional perspective. It very much tries to address the sense of the politics of space, geography, and place in a world where we are both building upwards evermore within our cities, excavating downwards evermore into the sort of subterranean world, and also populating the skies and the inner orbits with a proliferating array of, 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 of vehicles. So that's the sort of starting point. Um, my, my background is, is as a geographer and an urban planner. So my training is very much to try and bring the techniques of geography as a discipline into questions of the city. And the motivation from the book is very much to try and move away from a very flat sense of geography that prevails particularly in sort of Anglo-American human geography over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, if we see pictures of urbanization and maps of urbanization in geography, we do get a very profound sense of the urbanization of space. This is a, a map that's been produced by colleagues at Harvard in the Urban Theory Lab, who are tracing all of the ways in which, whoops, let's get this right way, the right way around, the conventional spaces we call cities are actually bound up in a world that's being labeled planetary urbanization. The sense of the whole world is becoming urbanized in, this, in way beyond the traditional sense of cities. So here we have data on all of the transoceanic trade flows, the optic fiber connections, perhaps airline grids and so on, lacing together the world's cities into a sort of planetary network of cities. But this is a very flat view. And it's a very flat view that stems from the flatness of the way geography thinks of places and spaces. Now, we have to look at why geography is flat. Okay? Why is geography, as Isle Wiseman says, a flat plane? And he talks about the traditional idea of geography being about a flat idea which ignores the up and down dimension. It's, it's the study of the surface of the earth. That's why we all have maps. That's why we all have atlases, which are preoccupied with one cut through a three-dimensional view of places. Okay? And there's a long history as to why the vertical aspect was denied or neglected in geography. Um, you, you might remember maps like this, for any of you who study geography, where the ideal city will be portrayed as a flat plane. And the structure will be different layers or different circles or different concentric zones. You might remember from sort of anyone who's got an urban planning background, people trying to plan cities would very much take that, those ideas on board and again have a flat map, a flat map of the ground to decide and plan what was going to be built where. Now in a world that's increasingly about upward and downward buildings, up and down above the world, the, the Earth's surface, up, uh, below the Earth's surface, the book very much argues that that's not enough. And there's a lot of people working more on questions of what goes on above ground and what goes on below ground. So this is a very much coming from a geography perspective. I'm very aware that many other disciplines, architecture for example, archaeology, geology, climatology, philosophy and so on, were, had a very much more in-depth discussion of the question of the vertical than have geography. But just to hammer home the point, when geographers talk about vertical, they don't even mean the up and down dimension. Very often they'll mean, um, in economic geography, what they call vertical hierarchies. So they'll be looking at links within a company or a firm. That will be a vertical 
discussion, or perhaps in the city, the way New York dominates smaller cities, will be a vertical connection based on hierarchy. When geographers meet, and these are a few geographers, in a huge conference center in the middle of an American city every year, and you normally get about seven or 8,000 geographers at the American Geography Conference, it's quite extraordinary, they will go all over the, the, the hotel complex to loads and loads of discussions about cities and how cities are changing, um, and they will not talk about the fact that they're relying on this elevator all the time. Because transport doesn't involve elevators. Transport geography involves aircraft, involves transport, involves highways, involves public transport. But because elevators gotten down, they're, they're not really in the imagination of geography. In fact, geographers have written so about three articles on skyscrapers as far as I can tell. Because their flat idea of cities is so preoccupied with the ground level. And geographers have this idea of, of places where they can map how people move around along with the time they spend moving around. This is called time geography. So if you move around between your home and your grocery store and so on, you have a, a representation of how people move around in places. But on this map, this way of representing cities, that is not going up and down, that is just resting on a flat surface. So I'm laboring the point, but geography is very much configured as a flat discipline, as, as in many discussions at the moment. So what the book tries to do is to take the power of geographic thinking, geography is very good at thinking about, critically, about power and politics as it changes and shapes places and people, what would happen, and this is a quote from Trevor Paglin, who lives in a skyscraper about 300 metres away, but he's always very, very busy, so can't be with us. What would happen if you took geographic thinking, and instead of this horizontal axis, you would start to look at the up and down axis much, much more powerfully. So, for example, in Palestine, um, you can have a political border that is horizontal political border that on a traditional map would be impossible to represent. How do you represent a political border which, did, which separates Israeli territory in space above with the settlements from Palestinian territory in space below? When you look at a vertical world, these things become increasingly clear. What about the idea of owning the subterranean rights of minerals and oil, which is so important, and water, increasingly important in the struggles of politics and space. Or what about owning the air rights of other places? A lot of states are so, are so weak or so dominated by other states that they have no fly zones over them, which means another country can control the air spaces above them. But again, how do you map that in a traditional way? What about space technology and the, the increasing efforts by states to populate orbits with satellites and space weapons? And what about the struggles over the subterranean spaces and so on? So the book engages with a whole range of different examples of these things. And it sh starts to show the power from a geographic point of view of taking the up and down view, as well as the, the traditional horizontal view. This is a very famous map, or half of a very famous map, of how the famous um, Parisian engineer Baron Haussmann plowed through a whole load of um, boulevards that shaped modern Paris in the 1850s. You may, if anyone's been to Paris, you'll see the boulevards as being a really dominant part of the experience of Paris. And this is how we traditionally sort of see this in geography, the way they laid out on the flat surface of the city. If you look at the vertical side, you start to see that the tenements that were built in Paris have a really complex structure that, again, when you people look at ge the geography of inequality, you totally miss. You totally miss because we're obsessed with this flat map. We're obsessed with poor people being here, rich people being here. Increasingly, and in many cities in New York, you see the elites are sprouting in towers above the less well-off. And we're seeing what I call a luxification of the skies. And in, in Parisian, in the 1950s, you had the bourgeois communities and families in the middle layers, and you had the, the poorer people in the attics. This was the world before the elevator. So the attic was a real difficult place to live because of all the effort involved going up and down to get 
just to move your body up and down and also to access services. Meanwhile below Paris a huge range of different structures were being built, a sewer network, a whole load of other crucial utilities that again became sites of struggle where certain political groups were trying to gain access. Victor Hugo writes about this beautifully in Les Miserables, all about political activism in the underground of the city to try and change what's going on in the surface. So you see the city much more as a volume. And for a geographer, that's quite a radical change. For architects, probably less so. So the book tried, is split into two. We have a section labeled above, where we're looking at everything from satellites, through drones, helicopters, skyscrapers, high-rise housing, air quality and air pollution, through questions of um, even the ground itself. And by looking up and down, in an up and down way, you can start to see that the ground itself is increasingly made under cities. In terms of below, we're sort of following on from the famous book of Harry Granick from the 1940s about what would happen if you actually look below the surface at all of the complex politics and struggles over the ground, the archaeology, the tunnels, the bunkers, uh, and so on, and the basements. I'm very much following on from many other colleagues with the book, and one of the most powerful at the moment is a, is a scholar at Harvard, I don't know if you can all see this, Pierre Bollinger, who's actually starting to do similar work. He's saying that landscapes can be cut through. You can start to see cities as sections. This is a city here on the surface with its towers and so on. These are the underground infrastructures that you start to see below the surface. These are some of the mining systems that are necessary to bring the resources up for cities to work. And some people are calling skyscrapers inverted mindscapes because all of the materials that go into those skyscrapers above our heads have to be dug out of the ground somewhere. The metal has to be mined. Um, the aluminium has to be dug out and so on. The sand underneath the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is actually brought in from Australia because of the absence of local high quality construction sand. And similarly in the oceans, Pierre is looking at the question of the ocean as a volume next to the city, but also looking at satellites, drones, air spaces, air quality and so on. The emphasis here is very much that cities are about not one ground level. Obviously, we're looking at cities which are increasingly stacked. New York's been stacked for centuries. Ancient Rome has seven-story high-rise housing. This is not new, but it's intensifying. It's intensifying in terms of all the satellites and drones above our heads, the air spaces, vast things we call cruise ships, which now have seven or 8,000 people stacked upon them moving around the world for, for leisure and entertainment, the massive proliferation of high-rise housing, the massive extension of underground spaces, and so on and so forth. And this is what Henri Lefebvre, who's a very famous theorist of cities, called the independence of volumes with respect to the original land. So there's a, great, there's a powerful sense now that what is ground? Where does ground exist? Underneath our feet, we might think of it as a natural ground, but it's not a natural ground. It's probably 10 to 15 meters of many parts of New York that is manufactured, has been made over centuries by reclamation, by infill, by cutting away the landscape to create what we call the ground. And in New York, there's such a, sorry, in Hong Kong, there's now such a, a profound sense that people don't even see the ground. You know, they're living a multi-tier existence traveling in elevators as much as they do in subways. And there's a sense of being a city without ground. In fact, there's a book of the same name. So I'll just quickly move on to some more examples. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just flit flitting through here. A lot of the emphases in the book uh, fall on how we are in an increasingly unequal world. We're in a, a world where powerful elites have ever more control. There's a, there's a startling statistic that the number of people who own 50% of the world's wealth can now fit in a London bus. 50% of the world's wealth. And that number is decreasing all the time because of the sorts of global capitalism we are enmeshed in. Those elite powers are having huge impacts on our cities. In New York, everywhere you see, there's super prime 
elite housing going into the skies. Towers sprouting everywhere. London's the same. We're having the skies of the cities become much more luxury spaces where elites can literally remove themselves from the service. Um, they, can, they can go up on their high-rise elevators and separate themselves from the ground level. In London, we're getting extraordinary basements where it's super wealthy people can build sort of James Bond type lairs below the Regency terraces of Belgravia. In Sao Paulo, we have a tiny elite that moves around, avoiding the ground level entirely, like a butterfly hovering between hel helipads on tops of corporate skyscrapers or country clubs. When you look at New York from the roof, and this is a wonderful book by, I can't remember the name of the photographer. Has anyone ever seen this? Well, Up on the roof? Yeah. So we start to see a different view when we're looking at the city from above. You can see all of the luxury spaces on the tops of the, um, the elevator, sorry, on the tops of the, the high-rise buildings, which are invisible from the ground up. So the city looks very different from the top level. So a, a big emphasis is on how, um, how elites are colonizing that space. And I'm afraid we have to put this in as well. Because so much of this symbolism of elite power, being about moving in the sky, being about having tall buildings in the city, being about using gold, which is dug out from the deepest parts of the ground, to symbolize that power, do come down to uh, our friend slightly, slightly further north in, in the Trump Tower, as we speak. We can look at the race of skyscrapers. I know there's a big emphasis here. I'm going to so, um, how long have I been talking? 20 minutes. 20? Okay. 20. I'll just finish with, with this theme. I think the, the race of skyscrapers is a very, very powerful example of how we need to politicize um, architecture, of how we need to make this so called race between architects, between um, developers, between cities into a political struggle. Because we see a huge shift in the geography and politics of skyscrapers. They, they very much started as, um, in, the, in New York and in Chicago, as emblem, emblems of corporate power, of the power of the, the famous initial architects like, like uh, Louis Sullivan, who very much embodied them in a sort of masculine struggle to be upright and to be dominant and to, serve, and to work with the most powerful corporations of the day which became symbolized, of course, by their skyscraper. All struggling for land and air rights in the center of the big business cities of the day. Now we have uh, skyscrapers, this is the Burj Khalifa, which opened in January 2010, as I happen to be traveling through Dubai. This is where the book starts, in fact, the journey to Dubai from uh, my home city, where rather than a, a forest of skyscrapers being developed to symbolize the power of the companies, the tower itself becomes a symbol of the country. And the tower becomes a statement for the country to say, we are a place that matters. So there's this fetish and obsession with going higher, sometimes, sometimes justified with the language of sustainability or greenness, but I think even many architects will realize, will agree, it's often a, a very sort of thin layer of green wash and often this is symbolized by the leader. Again, it's often a male discourse, a male representation of the dominant male with the big tower. And this is the famous image of the skyscraper architects in the 1930s in New York. When you see the construction of these towers, and there's a whole lot of discussions in the book about the new technologies of construction, the elevator technologies using carbon fiber or maglev systems which allow elevators to move faster and faster, higher and higher up these buildings. And it's the elevator that's the constraint here. There are now new elevator technologies being designed through some of the big companies like Kone and Hitachi, which will be capable of pushing towers to 1.5 to 1.6 kilometers. So it's the elevator that's the constraint there. Now the new elevator technologies are around, I expect to see this race proliferating further. When you look at the technologies here, you see that the actual um, height of the towers 
is often very much struggled, obsessively shaped by the, the demand to be the highest. So this race is shaping the architecture in a very direct way. And some research have actually shown that between 15 and 30% of the latest towers are very, very pinnacle. The bit that, that becomes temporarily the highest building is often what's called vanity height. It's space that is so limited in terms of its um, floor space that it's unusable. It's purely there to, to gain that record book, that place in the record books, because it's basically lift shafts and infrastructure. So some of the vanity heights on some of the tallest towers coming in, like the Jeddah, the current tallest tower is just being uh, constructed in, um, in Jeddah. It's just over a kilometer high. The Kingdom Tower, designed by the SOM company in Chicago, who do a lot of these uh, skyscrapers. The, the, the vanity height of that tower is going to be 300 meters. Just, just basically a useless stump with, a, with an elevator inside it to, 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 to make that back. So, so much of this book is very much emphasizing the symbolic power of being above, the symbolic power of being high, and the symbolic power in terms of our language, because all of our words about power, status, privilege, all of our words about poverty um, and inequality are actually vertical words. If you think about it, upper class, lower class, feeling up, feeling low, being depressed, and so on. So our language is very much coded with metaphors about being above and below. Um, I think I could go on. Go on? Maybe a couple more. Just to say a little bit more about the, yeah, the housing phenomenon. So I think this is particularly important. Many cities from Vancouver to Melbourne, from Toronto to New York, from London to um, Sydney, are very much being shaped by a withdrawal of emphasis on high-rise housing as a social project. Sometimes actively demolished. This is the demolition of some of the modernist high-rise high housing in Glasgow in the UK, where many of the high-rise housing projects have been erased and destroyed. Sometimes for very good reasons it was a, a, a very much a project with mixed results, let's say that. The trouble we have is that that era is being used to dismantle the entire system, even when some of the social housing was incredibly successful and incredibly popular. What we're seeing in a city, in a world of cities of increasing inequality, where the, the, the elites are trying to sell skylines as symbols of being important, and where global financial and speculative um, real estate markets are bringing investment in from all over the world, is the growth of towers all over places like Manhattan which aren't even necessarily occupied by people. They're owned as assets. They're owned as investment vehicles, sold off plan on the other side of the world because New York real estate is such a great investment. So when these are designed, you, you see startling levels of luxury, startling levels of space, which actually completely destroy further the idea that it's about density and greenness. The most powerful example is 432. Park Avenue in New York, which I'm still gobsmacked by, having seen it yesterday. I've read so much about it. Taller than, um, I think it's taller, but tallest building in New York. It's literally a stack, as you all know, I'm sure, of a hundred apartments. There is one apartment on each floor. The top ones started at 95 million, and I think are going to 120 already. So each apartment has that view of the whole city, which means the whole city can see that apartment. There's probably 200 people in the whole town, if that, because so many of the owners are absentees. So I think there's a huge political crisis about high-rise housing because of this sense that we're demolishing um, housing for ordinary communities, people who are working in the city, contributing to the vitality of cities, to the essential services of cities, and because of our sort of craven desperation to build prestigious projects in these highly globalized times. We're building these luxury cocoons, often uninhabited, that have been sold like this. This is one in, in Mumbai. It just says here, wouldn't it be great to have the same address as God? <laughs> okay, so we see so many powerful symbolic registers going back to the history of religion and the sense of God being good and up there and hell and devilishness being down there. Um, this is the same one, and I'll just finish with this. It says, 
when you have amenities up in the sky, you can expect your spirits to be continuously elevated. Vertical metaphor after vertical metaphor. You are not in the city, you are of the city. You are floating above the city serenely, with all of that poverty, decay, and corruption below you at a serene and safe distance. This one even suggests on another part of the billboard that the higher you go, the cooler you get, because there is a sense of heat crisis in many of these cities. And you see it go on and on, way, way above the, above the rest. So this is the luxury city. This is the city that we're, we're having to confront that's been built all around us. Not necessarily all around us, but certainly in the skies above us. Some of these buildings are animated by elevators that can take automobiles into the sky. At the same time, as many of the elevators in these old projects are falling apart through lack of maintenance. So this is just one indication of many in the book where I'm trying to force a critical and political perspective, which is what geography is good at, into this up and down dimension. There's many, many more I could talk for probably beyond your wildest sense of patience about this stuff. But uh, I really, really appreciate you all um, coming along in a very, very wet night in New York to come along and hear some thoughts. And I very much appreciate the panel for you. I would say a few words as well. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are you going to stand or sit? Yeah. Let's Should just, we sit? Let's just sit. Yeah, let's see. So thank you for that. And thanks for a, a really terrific book. Um, uh, and so, so maybe I'll just kind of try to draw you out a little bit more. Please and do. then op open up the floor for questions. Um, uh, I, I mean, if you, if you read the book in, in one sitting, I can tell you, you know, it, it, I mean, it does have the shape where you're, you know, starting from kind of suborbital, you know, gal virgin galactic level or drone level and, and then dropping uh, down below the crust of the earth. But in the, it, it, somehow also in the course of it, it starts to animate yeah. where you feel that, you know, at, at many times you're sort of plunged or flushed, um, you know, at different moments to different levels in a kind of jagged way or like a kind of roller coaster with many curves. Um, but, the, but I had the sense after the whole of it that um, the place where, I mean, where the roller coaster starts kind of like clicking and the traction starts really getting strong and you have to really slow down and, and hear your argument is somewhere around, around this stuff, somewhere mm. around the kind of luxury, luxury housing where, you know, all that is solid and all the rest of it. Um, so, so I'm wondering, you know, often a book has a kind of a, not a mascot, but it has a kind of engine. And I'm wondering if, if that, if getting to that part of the argument is felt that way for you. It's, um, it's a very good question, and it's challenging because the book wasn't written in the structure that it's come out, which is so common, I think. It's such a complex book. I mean, there's 16 chapters. Three chapters weren't even able to make it. There was going to be one on science fiction, which is all about the up and down dimension in cities. Um, there's one about the fact that our bodies are so vertical, and there's one about flyovers and so on. And they were all written separately as drafts. And then I had a lot of arguments and... and discussions with the editors at Versa, who I must acknowledge has been fabulous, especially Leo Hollis, um, to say, you know, how are we going to structure this? How on earth can we make this into a single narrative? And we ended up by going from satellites down to, down to mines with lots and lots of things in between. The point about the interconnections is, is a very important one because the last thing I wanted was to suggest that cities are simple strata now and that we have the built stuff here and we have the above stuff here and we have the mine stuff here. All of these things are very much interconnected and all of these things rely on each other. And the skyscrapers one is an amazing example because the skyscrapers being built in, in Dubai are often, as I say, bringing in ground from somewhere else. They're often using sand from other places. They use um, they're reliant on energy wealth brought into the ground. They're reliant on um, bauxite dug out from Africa. The skyscrapers in Toronto are fueled literally by the mining industry, which is centered on Toronto and so on. So I'm very much trying to emphasize 
what geographers call a relational sense of how one place connects with another within this bigger three-dimensional view. So yeah, this was the stuff I probably got most angry about, when maybe that's one of the ways in which um, the text fizzes a bit more, um, because you, it is perhaps the most startling example of, of the power and the need for this 3D perspective. But there are many more. There are air pollution crises all over the world, for example. This saturation of the skies with drones is very important, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and also the, the struggles over the, the subterranean worlds of cities are, are all important too. Yeah, but I, I, and I, I had the sense that you were, um, you know, that you were somehow, you're not, you're not trying to design, you're trying to present to us, to, I, in, in rough, rough quote, quote to, to, to present for us the grounds for action, um, to sort of tr trace the, that section um, that might nourish our political imagination. But there was so much at that moment to nourish our political imagination. So, so many spatial variables being traded in this kind of visa or real estate casino of, you know, and the, and the, the flip from, as, as you say, skyscraper to mindscape, where these appear to be just great big old piles of, you know, shiny stuff gotten from the, from the, from the mines, which, which it has to be said also that it's one sort of shocking thing about the, um, the mine uh, part of the story is, is the 3,900 meters, mm -hmm. you know, beneath the ground, which, yeah, yeah. which dwarfs the... Maybe I can pick dwarfs the, There's a lot more in here. Yeah, I, the I, I was too ambitious. Skyscraper. As usual, where do we go? Right at the end. Blurry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is the point, really, that so much of our imaginary of the, the city is, is conventionally centred on the ground level. It, it treats that as the flat... Um, and that goes in geography, plus in urban, urban design terms as well. There's so little debate about the design of the subterranean city or the, the, the supraterranean city. And in places like uh, Hong Kong, people are inhabiting not a ground level city with a few structures and a few, they are inhabiting a giant megastructure, effectively. And they are spending as much time going up and down, perhaps as much distance going up and down in elevators as they are horizontally in subways. But because subways are the things that transport planners deal with, um, that's still the focus. Um, in Hong Kong, too, we realize that the ground itself is actually made, just as in New York. You know, the ground isn't a natural thing in many cities. It's been accumulated and manufactured to a startling degree. And one of the examples of this relation now is that the ground is being made in many cities around the world to look cool from satellites. Right? Why, why is Dubai creating these massive palm structures? Why, uh, why are you getting these star-shaped islands and these fish-shaped islands? In, in Bahrain, we have ama more amazing examples too because the, the, the majority who are not benefiting from Bahrain's wealth realized that how they weren't benefiting from Bahrain's wealth from Google Earth. So they had, this, this was the 2011 uprising. They had amazing imagery that was previously only accessible to the US military that showed how they were all squashed in to these traditional cities while the tiny elite were manufacturing the, their own land all over the, um, the, the edges of Bahrain to be turned into luxury landscapes that they would then profit from. And it was the view of the satellite. So a lot about the book is about the politics of the looking down and looking up, whether it be through satellites, through the view from elite housing structures, whether it be from helicopters, whether it be from cable cars and favelas or, or what have you. But in terms of the mindscape, you know, you'll be so familiar with this, this part of the script. Whoops, let's get this the right way around. You know, this progression towards taller and taller towers, and this is the one that's been built in Jeddah. But how many times do you see the subterranean parallel? The fact that we were down to three, three kilometers in the 1950s. And we're now on the verge, again using the same technologies that are used to build high, of four to five kilometer mines in, in South Africa for gold. Gold is the deep, the deep mine. Because we've, we've explored, we've already got most of the stuff that's um, in the lower, lower orbits. So the point about the perspective is that you have to look at both together 
and you see the relationship between them. Yeah. The history of San Francisco, there's a wonderful book about how skyscrapers were using the same technologies that were developed in mines. The elevator was, re was really honed in the mine before it was in the skyscraper. The ventilation system, the communication system, even the famous structural systems <coughs> that we used in, Chica in Chicago's um, skyscrapers were first used to hold up mines once all of the gold stuff had been removed and sat in California. Mm -hmm. so, so there's amazing um, potential mm -hmm. from these perspectives. This gives you the scale of the deepest mine, by the way. These are um, Burj Khalifas on the right. Mm -hmm. Okay, And these, this is just an image of, you get 300 gold miners going down to the bottom, um, three, over three miles, 2.4 miles in two, two stops it's 65 degrees centigrade down there. What's that in Fahrenheit? It's pretty warm anyway. They have to have 20,000 tons of ice a day to stop the miners from baking. And where does this gold go? Well, it goes and sits in, in a vault in some bank as a symbolic value of, of exchange rates and so on. Or it sits on Trump's plane as he flies to and from uh, Washington. So yeah, I mean, this, 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 to say this is politically charged is, is understating it. Five miners a, a week die in the gold mines of South Africa to dig that out of the ground. Yeah, you know, the, and, that, and it's that, that temperature, that grit and so on, which is throughout the book. So, you know, as much as one can be nourished by something like Benjamin Bratton's book, The Stack, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's great to see a book that, that is dealing with the lumpy, heavy materials of it. I mean, it reminds me of a sort of moment in, in the 90s when Alan Skula said, look, yeah, those, these are virtual packets, but I'm going to go, that, that are being exchanged in the world, but I'm going to go look at the heavy stuff. I'm going to yeah. go look at the containers and go look at the sort of acres of space in which those so, containers are being traded and things being manufactured to put yeah. in them. And, th and this book seemed very much like that to me because there was heavy, lumpy, gritty, warm, hot, uh, cold, things yeah. uh, that are another set of assets, another set of things that are being traded, another set of shiny things that are being flashed in front of the wealthy. Um, uh, and and it, it, it also to say that, that, you know, this is an information system. You know, th sure. This heavy stuff is an information system. It doesn't really need Airbnb to make it dance. It's sure. already something that's being traded and uh, and I think that's really nourishing for a political imagination. Well, I think despite all of our discussions about information society or knowledge, capitalism or whatever, the resources upon which our economies and societies are based are still very tangible and very visceral and very real. And they, they're involving huge amounts of labor in places we don't see. You know, we rely on extraction for virtually everything in our world, whether it be the scarce metals in our mobile phones that come from war zones in Congo, whether it be the gold that these guys have to dig out. Um, a lot of the things we take for granted in our everyday um, society and everyday urban life are ground out in distant places by people having really, really big struggles in labor conditions that would be um, very much frowned upon if they're in the global north. And I just want to give another example of the, the many others in here that this four-hour presentation would have allowed you to see. Uh, this, this really struck me as well, this sense of the fact that cities are making their own land. You know, cities like, this is not a new phenomenon. Mumbai was made out of seven islands. New York's um, shape has changed dramatically over the, over the centuries. But now there is a global shortage of sand. There's a huge sense of crisis because the right sand for building these huge manufactured land, this is the Bahrain reclamation. I, I think reclamation is the wrong word. It's manufactured land. It's not reclaimed. Where is it reclaimed from? It's completely manufactured ground. This ground is made by, by these dredges. This is called a, a rainbow process. The dredges literally pull out the, the aggregates and the sand from deep deep in the immediate vicinity. They often have very big ecological impacts. Um, these sands are then used and compacted to create land that is then, as in this very famous case in Singapore, the Marina Sands Resort Complex, 
It's built on manufactured ground, okay? So it creates this luxury surface here with its infinity pool that everyone who, who resort, who can afford to go there, looks out on this spectacle of the city. And you think, where is this ground? How is Singapore getting bigger? Singapore is getting bigger by basically stealing the ground from poor countries nearby. Its ground itself is being stolen and taken from Cambodia, Indonesia, and Southeast Asia and into these places. Often it's illegal, this is why you're having um, battles, this is in, Mum in Mumbai, to stop illegal sand mining. So you'll see the sovereignty and territory of a state literally being undermined by sand movements that are organized on an industrial scale, legally, quasi-legally, illegally, um, to allow wealthy cities to, to terraform in a sort of science fiction sense. And without a, a sort of vertical view, you won't be able to encompass the fact that these things look cool from satellites in your phone that are linked to um, a GPS system run by the US Air Force. You won't be able to see where this ground material comes from. So, so the, the vertical view really opens up the politics of this stuff in a really necessary way, I would say. So I also, want, I also wanted to draw you out about um, a critique of Ed Glazer. Um, just to sort of, uh, I mean, a few years ago I was in um, a part of downtown Las Vegas that Zappos had bought um, most of downtown Las Vegas. And there were lots of young people running around who were treating urbanism as a kind of startup. You know, um, mm. and they had under their arm Ed Glazer, and they had bullet the pointed. Of the city, yes, right? yeah, and they had yeah. bullet pointed it's lists on whiteboards and so on. Uh, so, so I wonder, I wondered if I wondered if you would sort of just um, talk a little bit about um, either that critique that you have of of Glazer, or why you think there are certain people who are given authority to talk mm. about the city. Um, what, what's the evidence that suddenly uh, galvanizes um, attention? I don't know if people know Ed Glazer. He's a, the world's most influential urban economist. He works up, 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 up at Harvard. Um, he's very famous for his book, The Triumph of the City. And he's one of several economists who have very much pushed the idea of building skyscrapers as saving cities in the last 20 years. He actually wrote an article in the Atlantic magazine saying building skyscrapers will save the city. His argument is simple, really. His argument is that um, low-rise housing in New York, neighborhoods like New York, neighborhoods like London, are holding back the city. They've been taken over by the wealthy who have benefited from their preservation. And that there's a huge housing crisis because of this. Some of this is true, but what his suggestion um, that derives from that um, analysis is hugely problematic. What he suggests is that cities just need to build high. Cities need to have a forest of housing skyscrapers, very much in the, in the model of Vancouver in the last 20 years. This model has even become called Vancouverism, the sense of building new condo towers as a housing solution. But it's not a housing solution. As we see in extreme cases, it's actually providing luxury skies for tiny elites of super wealthy people who can afford these astronomical amounts of money. 70 to 80 million is, is the high, a high amount everywhere. But what we're seeing is that sort of discourse of um, just simplistically relating the form of a city to its social outcomes without taking into any account the regulation and the control of who owns housing, who lives in the housing, how access to the housing is, is regulated or controlled by markets, by own occupation, by renting, by different con control. All of that's gone. It's just a simple equation. If we have loads of towers, the housing problems will be over. Those towers are making housing problems far, far worse. That's absolutely obvious. They're being built on the landscapes of social housing projects which have been dismantled. So that we have this parallel discourse that high-rise housing for less well-off people has been, been a huge failure, whilst we bring in spaces for the super-rich, which have been justified and lauded as, as fantastic. We need to get back to a sense of controlling who has access to housing at regulated and affordable costs, or our, how our cities are just going to become, excuse me, gilded spaces for the super-rich, 
and where nobody else who actually runs cities and makes cities vital and lively places can possibly remain there. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge problem the way those arguments have been simplistically swallowed by policymakers. Right, and and what is it that is, is it is it that it's uh, is it it's based on a kind of data collection or is it a certain kind of character? It's based on ideological that's... myth. Yeah, I'd yeah. say. Um, I can't hold myself. Yes, I, 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 I wanted to. I'm, I'm exactly the moment when I was going to open up to the floor. So, are there questions that yeah, you may, may please? I? Please do. Um, so, there's so many things I fundamentally disagree with you about. Not about mines, and not about mm. ninety million dollar penthouses. But yeah, yeah. if I might introduce an alternative concept that has political implications, and I think you entirely ignore mm. by indicting the high rise as the uh, as the impossibility of a solution. No, no, no. Can, can no, let me say it. Let okay. me say it. Okay. That the word, That's not what that, I'm saying. Well, okay, I, okay whatever. Um, You're not. But the word density mm. um, is not a part of the problematic that you establish for high rise housing. You're, you say, well, it's only the rich people are going to live the highest up in the sky. But I would propose that from an environmental point of view as well as a political point of view for a better cities that something which we, we called an exhibition that we did that looked at Hong Kong and New York and mm -hmm. compared them and talked about vertical cities mm -hmm. that if you contrapose something called that we call vertical density with horizontal density and you find examples of that, you would find that horizontal density in cities like Mumbai and Cairo, where they're the most physically congested, right, and they're, they're the most dense per Absolutely. capita yeah. populations, that those cities correlate with poverty as opposed to cities like, well, Manhattan or, or Hong Kong or Singapore, where the high rise is embraced in order to incorporate mass transit as a solution for locating people and work, that vertical density actually correlates demonstrably with affluence. And how do you solve that problem? Correlation does not equal causation. That's well, the trouble. It, it is. Just because Hong things, Kong, in fact, it is. Just because things correlate doesn't mean there's any causal relationship between them okay. whatsoever. Okay. So I mean, my my point I'm is not a correlation. No, no, that I'm applying. Let me respond. Um, I am not saying that density is bad per se, absolutely not. What I'm saying is that the way the ideas of density are shaping planning in a lib what we call neoliberal society where markets are being left to shape outcomes is actually hugely socially regressive. It's hugely socially regressive because most of these towers are not being actually lived in by people of the city. Very often they are owned by the super prime owners who are buying off-site. In London, it's 85% of transactions are being, are being bought up as investment vehicles in the new towers from straw the rest man. of Asia. Oh man, talk about Hong Kong instead, or Singapore, where 90% of in the people own their own homes in, in high-rise houses. In Singapore, there's a great success because of a publicly organized Correct. housing system. In high-rises. In so high-rises. High no, I'm not saying problem. it is. I'm not saying it is. You're misunderstanding my okay. arguments. I didn't ever say that it's the form of the building that's a problem. I stressed repeatedly that it's about the way the housing is being allocated in terms of its distributional system that's the problem. Because these, these ideas of, of, um, of Glazer pay no attention well, to that I, at all. I, I think Glazer is more complicated than you said. You said mm. that simply his argument, I think, is, is more complicated. I'm not defending him. Mm. But I don't understand, because I encountered this on many occasions before, why you wouldn't talk about Beverly Hills as the, as the domiciles of the super rich and equally expensive housing, but why, why is it focused on skyscraper? It's just irrelevant. Because these are being built all over New York, everywhere you look, no, these they're towers. Not being, no, they're, they're definitely Well, there's not a lot of them going up, a lot of them have gone up and a lot more are going yeah, up. In I, London, I, I don't mean to, in to, London, over 250 towers over 20 stories in a traditionally low rise city have been built almost entirely as investment vehicles for off-site investors, right? This is, this is an empirical not, fact. Not to admit um, that there's housing built for other people, and I'm sorry, I don't no, there isn't. monopolize there the No, there isn't. There is no housing built for other people. 
All right. That's, that, the that's point. Glazer's argument about, about answering to Housing demands. is not being built for other people. He wouldn't regulate so that he can answer demands. Well, that's that the, is, that's it's the market Glazer failure. Argument. Market failure, I'm sorry. All right. But it's may, a myth. may I just point it's out a, a, a historical misrepresentation that you made about the skyscraper in the, at the turn of the century representing corporations? Because it's specifically um, contradicted by this particular exhibition, which is in the space right now, and my big slide, which is at the back of the room back there. Mm -hmm. So if you, that is every single building that was the tallest building in New York from, from in the last quarter of the 19th century to 1900. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that you, like the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat and reporters and all of that, mm -hmm. are focusing only on this little, the little top bit, so that if you look at that, that you know, slide in effect, and you just looked at the, at the little peaks that poke out, you would be looking at the tall ones and just concentrating your argument on that. But I would say cover those over and look at everything that's in the band below, which is every single building. So not tall, but all. The, 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 ma the massiveness of the bulk of, of the space sure. that's being added, rather than singling out the, just the, the peaks. The, the trophy on ones, yeah. So I mean, it's, a, it's I massively oversimplified the history. I, I totally agree. Okay, yeah, yeah. but if you look at this period as we did in every single building of the, of the period, because we had great data, um, corporations don't build these buildings. Entrepreneurs build the buildings. They are occupied not by a single company. Now, like the Woolworth Building did not occupy the Woolworth Building. It occupied executive offices in one and a half floors of a 55-story sure. building and a thousand different tenants. Sure occupied all the other spaces. They are the skyscrapers become the ultimate concentration, densification, and democratization of the businesses that are the lifeblood of the city. And that's the way you should see these buildings. They are not built by corporations no, and they're no. not occupied by no, corporations. But for, I mean I was stressing the period when they were very symbolic of the corporation. They are symbolic. So, they're you a know, trope, but you're misrepresenting what actually happens inside. It was a, it's a very long and complicated I'm, history. I'm gonna uh, just also just open up to other questions that might be so, you know, while well, in the time we have left that you, you, others might have. Um, Yes, at the back, yes, if you would. Um, can I ask you a geography question? By all means. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, in geography, there's been a massive debate over scale. And, you know, this vertical work is now coming out. I mean, you're going off to the forefront of this. And it might have enormous implications for how uh, the debate over geographical scale that, you know, usually stops at the body. It doesn't maybe go beyond into the subterranean, maybe, or... Is this maybe contributing to those debates that want to get rid of geographical scale completely? Um, that's a really, I mean, for, for, for non geographers here, geographers have been preoccupied by questions of scale because for a long time they tended to see scale as, as a, a sort of nested hierarchy. We had our bodies, then we were in a building, then we were in a neighborhood, then we had cities, then we had a country, and so on. Geographers are now much more interested in how, what's called rescaling, how how we might be consuming TV from New York, from, from Japan, at the same time as going to our local grocery store. But a lot of those debates were very much on the flat surface. And what, what, what I'm trying to do in this project is, is just to explore how key geographic concepts like scale, but also things like uneven development, how certain places get, do really, really well and certain places don't, inequality, how certain places are very, very wealthy and certain places don't. All of those traditionally have a very horizontal register. What I'm trying to emphasize is that rescaling is going on in a vertical way, in the way we connect seamlessly with satellites, the way satellites are, are, are being used to shape how ground is being made and so on. Uneven development might be happening in a vertical way too. In Guatemala City, which is another example where elites are living increasingly high-rise um, lifestyles, to escape increasingly violent street level experiences, um, they, they, they literally talk of living on a different level, of being, uh, living in elevated space uh, above the barrios and the favelas that are below them in the, in the incised valleys. So yes, I'm trying to very much emphasize words, um, those sort of geographical concepts operating in a much more three-dimensional way than has traditionally been done in geography, for sure, if that helps. 
Other questions? Yeah, so am I. <laughs> Let me find the appropriate um, slide here. This was a bit ambitious. Um, there is a separate paper that's in a journal called City, if anyone's interested. Just email me and I'm happy to send it to you. It's, I, do, I also have a SlideShare website where you can download it. But the, the, the argument here is that all of the famous sci-fi cities are... Um, well, very large number of them are profoundly organized based on stratification. <coughs> and whether we, we're talking about um, H.G. Wells in his famous, some of, what his, what, some of his early work, When Sleep Awakes, or we're talking about the famous um, Metropolis by Fritz Lang, which was shaped very much by Fritz Lang's visit to um, Manhattan in the early 1920s. Um, whether we're looking at the, the massively verticalized cityscapes of Blade Runner, or whether we're looking at the, um, the sort of dystopian uh, speculative fiction of Bar, each of those orchestrates the world into a series of layers, where often it is the wealthy at the top, it is the wealthy, this is um, an image of the creator of Metropolis, being confronted, I don't know if people have seen Metropolis, but it's the most startling um, film, um, perhaps the most influential, influential sci-fi film ever made. Um, being confronted after seeing the sort of subterranean bowels, and often it is the subterranean bowels where the workers are toiling away to keep the city going. So class structures are very much reified into, into layers as part of the, the, the devices of sci-fi. It creates extraordinarily powerful fiction. But that fiction has real effects, and what, what I'm trying to emphasize there also is that sci-fi uh, shape, is shaped by real cities in the way that Metropolis was a massively exaggerated version of 1920s Manhattan, in the way that Blade Runner was a massively exaggerated version of 1970s Tokyo, laced with a little bit of industrial architecture from England, laced with all sorts of other influences, even Mayan pyramids apparently, um, and the way Ballard was sh shaped very much by modernist housing debates in late 70s, early 70s Britain. But you have some of, the, some of these influences become much more real. In, uh, in the Gulf, for example, we have the, f the famous visual futurist who designed the sets of Blade Runner, Sid Mead, who's still around and doing a lot of fascinating work, doing tours of the Gulf states, talking about how their cities can almost mimic Blade Runner. We have the designer of the, the Burj Khalifa, the famous, the, the, high, the, la, the highest skyscraper in the world at the moment, and um, Adrian Smith, who works at the SOM, sort of highly influential skyscraper architects in Chicago, actually invoking the Wizard of Oz as an image when he was designing this building, invoking the Emerald City in the Wizard of Oz. And the interesting thing is that once these futuristic cityscapes, especially Shanghai and, and, uh, and Dubai, get constructed, they then become the sites for the next range of sci-fi films. Because the future's already there, and so the cycle continues. So there's a really fascinating relationship between imaginations of the, the vertical axis in sci-fi and the lived realities of the cities that, that, that have been constructed. I wish it was in the book too. I'm still, I'm still grieving. <laughs> but, some, but somehow the book, did, for me at least, did sponsor a kind of reverie that you know, if, if there was the kind of J.G. Ballard-esque high-rise like dystopian guy novel, you know, that in, in which, in which uh, uh, there was a cameo performance by a president-elect who was in real estate, that author would be dismissed as complete hack. You who know, was who flying was in gold plate at seven Yeah, pe peddling yeah. in cliché protagonists. I know, yeah. I know. Um, is there, the was irony. there one more last question before you? Um, Jack. I'm wondering if uh, sort of the urban futures of megastructures informed your thinking on any of the book? Yeah, in fact, another of the chapters that didn't make it was on flyovers and uh, the history of the, the sort of multi-tier modernist idea about building flyovers. Um, but there is a chapter in here called um, Skywalks, uh, Skytrains, Multi-Level Cities, which goes back to some of the futuristic think futurists of the 1920s, Antonio Santelli, especially a very famous Italian linked to the futurist movement in 
in, uh, in the early 20th century in Italy was very much about leaving the street. And so much of these fantasies and ideas about architectural futures are about the dirty, polluted street. Le Corbusier was very much influenced by the same ideas. And, and uh, Santalia was very much talking about, let's have elevators that go up the outside of buildings, um, like the Portman stuff in the 60s. Let's have radically vertical, layered cities. This was hugely uh, um, influential on the likes of Archigram in the 1960s, of course, as well. Um, and so the debate there is very much how real cities are being built at multiple levels now. Um, Hong Kong is another amazing example in terms of the, the multiple walkway systems. Um, in Hong Kong, you have subterranean tunnel systems and, and subway systems linked to a whole range of different walkway systems, which then go up into the, the, up, the, the upright parts of the city. I, I should mention that in February, Stefan Als, uh, who teaches at Penn uh, and is an architect and landscape planner, will talk about his book about Hong Kong called Mall City. So oh, okay. stay tuned. He's just changed that's, the date today. That's but one to watch. in February. That's definitely one to watch. What's fascinating about Hong Kong is it shows the limits of traditional flat maps. I started by looking at the limits of a flat view coming from the traditional idea of geography. If anyone's ever been to Hong Kong, you, you go to Kowloon and you buy a traditional flat map, you get something like this. This is basically absolutely useless. You may as well just throw it away and start again because this space is so complex in its layers, the same on the Hong Kong Island site, um, that you will just be completely confused trying to navigate, assuming the city is a flat surface. So what you've got in Hong Kong is a wonderful book called Cities Without Ground, and that by a couple of architects whose names... Jonathan skip. Solomon and... Um, uh, forget the other name, I'm sorry. That's right. But coming to terms with the fact that Hong Kong is really like this. If, you, if you're not going to get lost wandering around the different layers, you're not going to... Um, you're going to need a new type of mapping, a new type of representing cities in three dimensions. And I highly recommend this book because this is an, what's called an oblique map. Rather than looking down on a flat surface from above, you're taking a, a diagonal view and unpacking the multiple levels. So here you have the subway systems. Here you have the different sort of mall spaces at different levels. Here you have um, elevated escalators going up. You have ele es um, elevated walkways and flyovers and so on. And this becomes, this is a truly multi-level city. And this is a multi-level, as they say, where the ground... What is ground in this city? Where is the ground? And when you get to something geologically that might be ground anyway, it's being manufactured with sand that's being brought in from somewhere else. So there's a really profound sense in Hong Kong, the most verticalized city in the world, absolutely, of, of a radical sense of what a postmodern uh, theorist called Frederick Jameson, who's written lots about San Francisco wrote in the 1980s, way back in the 1980s, he had this sense of people in massive cities, increasingly electronic cultures with lots of screens and digital systems everywhere, being unable to place themselves, being unable to develop what he calls cognitive maps, maps in their head of how they locate within these massive worlds. This is not a cognitive map of Hong Kong. This is a cognitive map of Hong Kong. It's not just a physical way of helping you um, navigate, because if you just go to Hong Kong, you'll wander accidentally into a five-star restaurant. You'll wander accidentally into a, a corporate headquarters. You will, you will get disoriented. It's a, it's a sense of how we relate to our cities as well, which I think is, at the moment, particularly important. And it's interesting, you know, there's a crop of people from the design world that includes Pierre Bellanger and Jonathan Solomon et al. And, and others who are writing kind of the architectural equivalent of a, of a graphic novel. You know, they're, mm. they're, they're putting forward a kind of graphic evidence and, and look, you know, asking for an audience to understand another kind of um, reading, navigation, not, not only of cities but of, of large organizations like uh, Jesse Le Cavalier or, mm. or Claire Lister, um, you know, making those sort of hidden or secret or classified organizations yeah. more yeah. more graphic. I don't know if there's one, if there's another question, I know we've kind of gone past it's the time, maybe we can have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, there's a question that came up in 
into mind uh, based on what you were just talking about. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how this three-dimensionality and verticality complicates the idea of property, which I guess traditionally is just seen from the map straight down. If you have all these articulations vertically and three-dimensionally, does the sure. property have the same value? Uh, let's go right back to the start here. <laughs> Somewhere, I'm sure there's one here. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, property um, is the you know the legal basis for ownership. Need it's very much organised in in three dimensional ways. It, okay, in terms of uh, traditional urban urban questions, we're, we're we're constrained quite often in terms of the mapping traditions and in terms of the urban planning traditions by the flat surface, you know, the development, why should the development plan be a flat map when it's trying to shape a complex volume of space above the ground, on the ground, and below the ground? So there's, a, again, a powerful sense that we need new ways of representing property rights, access rights, use rights. I know, I know air rights is such a pivotal, pivotal question. I mean, the history of the 232 Park Tower, as I read it on your, your website, is, is extraordinary to me because it's, it's able to go so high because of a zoning ordinance uh, based in the 1960s, is that correct, 1961? Um, which allows the owners of one particular uh, building to buy up um, air rights, that's rights to build space, to fill volume of air with volume of building um, from adjacent sites. So once that's done, the building can go higher and higher, like a Lego, like a Lego system. So, Taking a three-dimensional view of, of, of the sort of legal geographies of ownership is absolutely vital. It's vital when you look at subterranean resources, because a lot of what's going on in the world's subterranean politics in places like Africa and Latin America is, is quite a violent grab and appropriation of resources in a sort of neo-colonial way, with a lot of very problematic results for communities who are living on the surface in terms of pollution, in terms of eviction, in terms of violence, and so on, um, we have to look also at the air rights. You know, the spaces to control air spaces, which are hugely important as the basis for commercial air travel, uh, for military control and satellite control, and so on. And then there's a whole legal geography and geopolitical discourse about space power, and which is very contested as as states try to con take some sort of stake. In, in the sort of satellite domains and the worlds of space vehicles, which have such huge commercial importance, but huge military and civilian importance too. Because it, as well as being in um, societies fueled through extraction, we're also satellite-based societies. You know, you take out 24 GPS satellites, the world would grind to a halt in ways that would be devastating, not just um, inconvenient. They would be life-threatening because we are so dependent on a whole range of infrastructures that are organised from those sorts of levels. So uh, it's a pivotal question. Well, I think we should now thank you for this talk and for this great book, and I urge you all to carry on the conversation and, and, and read it. It's a terrific book. Thank so you thank very much. You very much. Thank you very much.